I hope you've had a chance to read some of the remembrances that have been written about Pete's life. I thought some of them were wonderful. And there was an excellent one in the New York Times. I think it's a, Robin has it here. And he deserved every word in it. And some of those remembrances, including the Times one, noted that one of Pete's baptisms in his life of activity in the Teamsters Union was when he was beaten publicly in the streets of Las Vegas in 1976. I just wanted to say that uh, Steve Kindred was there with him, and he was beaten too. Steve was a hell of an agitator, but I guess he was a lousy bodyguard. <laughs> <clears throat> I met Pete when we were 29 years young. That picture, I, there was one picture of me in there, and I think we were 30 in that. And we had just recently launched our TDU movement. How many of you here, by show of hands, are Teamsters or retired Teamsters? Let's see who, how many, a lot, are in this house. People that worked with Pete and that knew Pete and knew what he stood for. And we had started our movement with some big ideas, like we would transform the Teamsters and the labor movement and make it a force for justice and equality and a society where solidarity is more important than greed. <clears throat> and uh, Pete never left those ideals until the day he died. Well, he showed up at one of our meetings in Cleveland, Ohio. Steve Kindred told me he was coming, and he said, this guy is going to be important. What struck me was he didn't say anything in the whole meeting. He just introduced himself, and he was completely quiet, which was, I promise you, was totally unlike all the rest of us. And then he went home to Detroit, quiet, and he started to build, like we were doing in, in Cleveland and, and Pittsburgh and other cities, but it turned out he was doing it a whole lot better. And uh, he was getting a network of people to work together to start talking about reform of the Teamsters. This was just a couple of months after James R. Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa, had died in July of 75. And Hoffa was from Local 299, like Pete. And so was the new president, Frank Fitzsimmons, so Pete was really at ground zero in the union. Fitzsimmons was more interested in golfing with Nixon. I understand he wasn't any good at golf, and he was even worse at representing truck drivers. And he wanted to deflate our little movement. So he called a, a, a fake strike for two days in a national trucking industry, the first that had ever been called. Hoffa had never called a national strike. He called quickie regional strikes. He called it on Thursday and Friday. This is the good old days when we didn't have to work weekends. Remember those good old days when a blue collar worker could get a weekend off? And um, so they used that to kind of deflate our steam and I suppose it worked. Except in Detroit where Pete had so many people organized, they stayed out in a wildcat strike. And I guess that was the moment that he became the Teamster Rebel. And it changed the course of his own life. Uh, like a, a fork in the road. Uh, the union leaders, a few months later, they actually expelled Pete from the union. And uh, we promptly got him reinstated with a court injunction. Actually, both of his attorneys in that case are here today, Ann Thompson and Mike Pitt who stayed his friends all those years. Then Pete got himself elected in that same, now we're in early 76, to be a delegate to the Teamster Convention. And of course, they're held in Las Vegas where all the Teamsters pension money was. A lot of you here are collecting pensions from the Central States Fund, and you're hoping it'll have enough to keep paying those pensions that you earned. And he got up. And they, these things are like, in those days especially, it was a bunch of, they made me look young. I mean, it'd be a bunch of old white guys in relaxed fit pants and, and just waiting to go to the casino. The, 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 the convention is fake. And Pete got up to the microphone and announced that the vote to elect Fitzsimmons was not unanimous. That they had made a mistake. And that, was, that was the day he was beaten after that. Pete accepted the role of, of leader many times I asked him to do things and I think he always accepted but he wasn't necessarily eager. He was the kind of leader, and Jackson talked about it, who would go behind and push people forward. The next speaker up here is going to be Dennis Wade. Dennis, you're up in about two minutes so don't, don't, be, don't be slipping out the back. Or maybe he'll tell you what 
people, because he was the kind of person that would be pushing on Dennis. He believed that ordinary people could become extraordinary people and then change the world. In our society, we seem to promote a different kind of leader. The one with the big talk and the big promises and the sound bites and, and it doesn't seem to be working well. I think the kind of leader that believes in ordinary people, that's the real deal. He did a hell of a lot for our movement in those difficult days and in the process. See, he had been the fair-haired boy in Local 299. Well, he didn't have hair, but he was still the fair-haired boy. There was a path for him into leadership at a young age. Office seniors people had made him a delegate to the, even the prior Teamster Convention when he was 25 years old. He could have been a, a union official and maybe a high up one. And he took a different track. He went on a different course. Wasn't gonna be that fair haired boy anymore. He was gonna stand for something. He was going to take a rougher road, but one that led in a lot better direction. Jackson quoted the great labor leader of a century ago and the great socialist, great American, Eugene Debs. And it was a, I have a different favorite quote of Eugene Debs's, which is, when I rise, it will be with the class, not from the class. And that, that summed up what Pete stood for. I've had a lot of people talk with me about Pete in the past month, and, and uh, you can imagine who some of them were, but a lot of them too were young people that maybe only met him at a TDU convention after he was retired, or maybe never met him at all. But they read about our history. And we teach that history, what it takes to build a movement. Incidentally, Jackson was a little modest when he spoke. He's a good example of that. He talked about Pete's influence. Jackson is a leader in an important struggle in this country to defend public education for all of our children, not just a select few, and to fight for school teachers. You know, I never thought that the flunkies of corporate America would succeed in making school teacher a dirty word in this country. And I'm sure Jackson, as he said, would say Pete had some influence on his course. A lot of people who make history are not the ones who rise up. Pete never went into national office in the Teamsters, became a big official. But when we went on to make history in the 1990s, as he talked about well on that video, and we continue to do it today to transform the labor movement, and we have not succeeded in that process, but we keep fighting and we keep fighting away at it. We're not going to give up. We know our history. We teach it to people. We know it was people like Les Cadman and, and, and Steve Kindred, and most certainly Pete Camerata, who started our movement. So I would say to Pete, if he were here, we miss you, and we're going to try to carry on in a way that you'd be proud of. Thank you. Pete and I, one day we were riding our motorcycles on Eight Mile Road and uh, we were going a little too fast and the police pulled up behind us and the only one that pulled over was Pete and he got the ticket and we, we had a good laugh about that because uh, <laughs> we just kept on going and he got the ticket the, that day. Uh, uh, but as a union uh, rep, you couldn't get a better guy. Uh, we got fired. Uh, Twelve guys got fired on the afternoon shift about a year after I started there. Uh, we had working conditions that were uh, very slippery on the loading dock and he went to a foreman and asked to get some speedy drive for the floor. And the foreman said, no, we don't have any, we're not going to get any, and I don't care if you break your neck. Well, uh, I think this was the very uh, beginning of Pete as a, as a, a union rep. He, he just got everybody together and everybody punched the clock and, and left and left the foreman standing on the dock by himself. Uh, of course, we all got fired, and we were off work for a day, and uh, uh, Local 299 represented us, and uh, we were at uh, uh, Shelby Hotel in, in Detroit, and I was, I think, 17 or 18 years old, so I was pretty nervous. Uh, you know, I l lost my first job, and I didn't understand what, what this was, and Pete was probably 23. Uh, we went, and... Uh, 
Uh, well, the first the business agent came out to the company and, and told us that I don't think I'm going to do much for you guys. Uh, you guys walked off the job. You kind of gave your jobs up. And uh, Pete took the guy by the tie. Now, you have to remember, at this time, Pete was about 400 pounds. <laughs> and he took the guy by the tie and walked him right out the door, out, out into the parking lot where we were, and just said, don't ever come back. Don't come back. We don't need you. So we went, we went to uh, Dave Johnson, who was the president of Local 299, and they had a meeting with the owner of our company. And what he told the owner of our company was, you are now out of business. You either take these guys back to work or you are out of business. We will shut you down right now. So we all got our jobs back, but if Pete wouldn't have got his job back, I don't know if he would have had the future in, uh, in the union that, that everybody uh, sees. You know, he saw success there, and that, was just, that opened his eyes, you know. My, uh, my life uh, pathway crossed twice with Pete. Uh, once when I was about, I think, about 27 or 28, when I was a young pup attorney, and uh, Ken alluded to the case, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but more recently, uh, when in the 90s, when I showed up at a uh, uh, convention of employment lawyers, uh, I sat down at a table, got to know a young lady by the name of Robin Potter, and uh, didn't know her, we just started talking and comparing notes and got to the part about, you know, who you married to and she started telling me about this union activist uh, living in Chicago and uh, it started to dawn on me that, was she really talking about my friend Pete from back in the 70s? And uh, lo and behold, she was. And uh, it was great. We. Uh, Pete was actually hanging around the hotel. We uh, went out for dinner, and I think we probably, over the years, had three or four dinners at these uh, annual conventions. So I was able to, thankfully, renew my friendship with Pete back in the 90s, and we stayed friends. Um, I, lost, I last saw my friend Pete uh, in September when I paid a visit to his home. Uh, Pete was pretty sick at the time. If you, if you uh, visit with Pete in September, you knew that he was in a good mood and he was getting around, but he was still quite ill. And um, Robin had stepped out of the room for a while and she was uh, preparing some food for us. And I said, you know, Pete, you know, how are you making it? He said, I couldn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't be here but for Robin. And he just went on and on about how wonderful Robin was. And, and, uh, and the family members and all the people in Robin's family and his family that took care of him. He was just so, so, so grateful. And um, told me that, uh, I mean, somebody said earlier that uh, Pete became a different person when he married Robin. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, I think that uh, he became a better person having married Robin. And, uh, and I think vice versa too. <laughs> Although I didn't know Robin before, but I'm only guessing that she got, she got a lot out of the relationship too. But P was very, very thankful for all the care that Robin gave him, gave, uh, uh, him at the end of his life. Um, he was very, very, uh, the only time I ever saw P cry was when he was talking about Robin. So uh, <clears throat> that says a lot about Pete. If you knew Pete, it took a lot to make that man cry. And uh, so, uh, as I thought about um, Pete, I went back to my library and um, picked up a book that I really uh, enjoyed reading a few years ago. It's a book by um, uh, J.M. Coetzee, uh, a renowned author from South Africa, he wrote a terrific book called uh, Disgrace. And uh, I had uh, dog-eared a page, I remember this page, I had gone back to it many times. And uh, he said, um, uh, he was talking to uh, uh, his son, uh, he says, uh, become major, Paul, live like a hero. That's what the classics teach us. Be a main character, otherwise what is life for? 
And Pete was a main character in a life dedicated to getting justice for the rank and file, for the little guy, for the ordinary everyday man, the one who was getting screwed not only by his employer, but by his union. And uh, I, can you, I can't believe that, you know, I'm looking out here, it was, was Pete Camarada a main character in your life? I mean, was that, is that an apt description of this man's life? I and mean, he was so important to so many people in this room, a main character in his life. So, you know, we heard about um, Pete's uh, struggle as a dissident. What, what was he struggling against? In, in the 1970s, the, uh, a, a number of Teamster leaders were convicted of irre irregularities in handling pension funds and accepting bribes from employers to stop strikes or reduce labor costs. In 1977, uh, allegations of control by organized crime forced the Teamsters to yield oversight to the central state's pension fund. Uh, his, uh, Fitzsimmons, who was alluded to earlier, was probably the most corrupt of them all, and uh, for many of you, fortunately, he died early in 1981. But his successor, Roy Williams, was convicted the same year of bribing a U.S. senator, and his successor, Jackie Press Presser, who became president in 1982, was indicted in 1985 for embezzling union funds and giving crime figures no-show jobs. So Ken and TDU and Pete Camerata, I mean, they were fighting against real evil. This was just not some sort of an academic hypothetical exercise for uh, uh, a class and activism. I mean, this was, there was real evil out there that was in control of the Teamsters. And these young upstarts had uh, quite a quite a job to uh, unseat this evil from this major labor union. So um, in the 1970s, you know, we heard the story about how Pete stood up at the convention, uh, and as a result of his courageous speaking out uh, against that evil, uh, had the holy crap beat out of him by the union uh, mob thugs. And I remember Pete coming to the office with, with his badge of honor, his black and blue marks, his, his, uh, his bruises. Uh, my connection with Pete was through Ann Thompson. Where, where's Ann? There's Ann. And Ann joined our firm and uh, brought with her this colorful character, uh, uh, colorful, colorful group of characters known as TDU. And um, I think I've represented most of them over the years. I know Steve, may rest in peace, was one of my clients. I think Dennis Wade was one of my clients over the years. Uh, there you are. There's Dennis. Yeah, you were one of my clients, right? Okay, right. So, right. All right, so yeah, we did a lot of work for a lot of people in this room. Did I get your job back for you? De Dennis, did I get your job back for you? I don't remember. Good, all right. <laughs> so, um, uh, Ken uh, alluded to this great free speech case. Now, for, the, for those of you who are not uh, lawyers, um, back in the 50s, uh, union members were routinely being expelled from unions for speaking out against leadership, especially those who may have been associated with uh, socialists or communist leanings. They were routinely uh, thrown out of the union. So Congress adopted the uh, Landon Griffin Act which gave uh, union workers the Bill of Rights, essentially the right not to be punished or retaliated against if you spoke out against the, the union leadership. And so Pete uh, exercised his rights to speak out against the union leadership here in Detroit in Local 299. Um, he was... Um, 
you know, a union dissident and the local 299 hierarchy recognized him as a dissident. But what does it mean to be a dissident? To be successful, you have to start a movement uh, to challenge the existing institution. And Pete and Ken and Steve Kindred and Dennis and Joe Ehrman and uh, so many other people that I knew along the way um, formed the movement. And uh, it, it, it gelled. And um, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to uh, one's enemies when you're starting a movement. But one lesson I learned from Pete, and I'll never forget it, is that it takes even more bravery to stand up against your friends when you're involved in a movement. Because not everyone who is on your side happens to agree with you. And sometimes you've got to fight within your own ranks to, to make things actually work. And Pete wasn't afraid to uh, disagree with his colleagues and sometimes got himself in trouble with his colleagues. But Pete uh, took on willingly the role of a leader. And as a leader in the dissident movement, he did not give a flying F about his enemies, but he cared very deeply about the people who were following him because he knew that if he made the wrong turn, he and all the people, all his comrades in arms would walk right off a cliff, following him to the end, to the end and to destruction. So he was very careful not to take false steps when he was in a leadership mode so that the people who were behind him would not be harmed by what he was doing. He was very, very thoughtful and very, very careful. And Ann uh, and I and other people would sit around the conference room with Pete and we would, and Pete would just go on for hours. I had to literally throw him out of the room to get him to stop talking about the strategy of doing this or doing that. He was so thoughtful about what he was doing. He never, he never tried to react. He always tried to think through everything that he was doing uh, when it came time to fight uh, the union establishment. So um, along comes this guy named Lawrence McHenry. Is he here today, by the way? I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he was a vicious guy. And he led the uh, charge against Pete. And the, and the strategy of the union was to expel him from the union. And under the union constitution, if you did certain things that, they, that the leadership thought was against uh, the union, you could be expelled. But they had to give you a trial. Um, they had to give you what amounted to would be a kangaroo trial. But, and they gave Pete his trial, and they brought out witnesses. And the witnesses said um, that um, uh, they had heard Pete say certain things that suggested that he was in favor of that wildcat strike that Ken had alluded to. They brought out witnesses who said uh, Pete was a member of the International Socialist Party, God forbid. Um, they brought out witnesses who said that Pete was guilty of associating with Ken Paff. Ken was the devil, and uh, Pete was guilty of associating with Ken. Witnesses said that they had seen Pete associating with Steve Kindred, who another, another radical union activist. Um, and uh, he um, uh, was uh, you know, indicted by the, the union leadership and finally expelled. Uh, he came to our office. Uh, we prepared papers, Ann and I and Ellis Bull. Uh, and we got the papers to the courthouse uh, late one evening. Uh, Bill Wertheimer, uh, a clerk for Judge Churchill, read the papers, drove the papers to the judge's house that night, had the judge 
issue a temporary restraining order from his kitchen table, brought it back to us, got a hold of me, came to my house, gave me the papers, and we had him delivered down on Trumbull you know, before midnight that night, and Pete was spared the uh, expulsion. And then we had, uh, a couple weeks later, we had a trial in court. Uh, witnesses were called. Uh, one of the witnesses we called in favor of uh, Pete uh, had his car blown up the next day. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa Jr. was the lawyer for the, for the local. I called Jimmy, I said, what the F is going on? What, you guys are blowing up cars. Just me, I had nothing to do with that. I had nothing to do with that. Uh, Anyways, Judge Churchill uh, ended up throwing the book at the union. Pete was fully reinstated and was um, given, uh, given back his full status as, as a union uh, member and was able to go on and carry on his, his role as a dissident. So um, I just said, let me wrap up by saying that um, Pete became a main character um, in his life as a dissident. I think, uh, I think he would be um, happy for, for, to hear me say that he was a main character in the life of a dissident fighting for workplace justice for the rank and file. I think, that, I think if you would say that was his main character role, I think Pete would be very, very pleased to hear that. Pete became a main character in my life and helped make my life worth living. Can, can anyone make a greater contribution to others than to do that? I think not. Uh, I'll never forget my friend Pete. He was an inspiration for me. And uh, I wish him every, every uh, wherever he is at, I hope, hope things are going right for him. Good luck, Pete. Thanks. Thank you very much.